asking us for Civil Beats Ideas Live show for Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. Very happy to have you with us today. And the title of today's show is How Can We Improve the Health of Our Near Shore Ocean Waters? We'll be here for the next hour or so. We're live, so we invite you to send us any comments that you have, any questions that you have. Today's show was inspired by an essay that Stuart Coleman wrote for us that ran in the Civil Beat Ideas section on June 6th. Stuart's piece was entitled, The Work to Convert Hawaii Cesspools Continues. And we're really happy that Stuart is here with us today. Welcome, Stuart. Stuart is the Executive Director of VI, or the Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations Organizations. We also have with us today, Emma Ewan. Emma, thanks for being here with us. Emma is the Native Ecosystems Program Manager for the Department of Land and Natural Resources. And we also have Daniel Amato here with us. Dan has done work with a number of organizations, including the organization whose hat he is currently wearing, the Surfrider Foundation. And he is a water quality specialist. So thanks to all three of you for being here with us today to help us understand what's happening in our in near shore ocean waters. Uh, what the issues are and what possible solutions there may be to improve the quality of our nearshore ocean waters. So we like to begin these shows by asking each one of our guests to tell us a little bit about themselves and the journey that they've taken that's brought them to be doing the work that they are doing. Um, today, uh, if you could, if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved with looking at the quality of our ocean waters and maybe connected with that a little bit, just tell us a little about your own relationship with the ocean. Um, Emma, will you start for us? Sure. I grew up in Hamakua on the big island of Hawaii and surfing, you know, diving out there, places that us Oahu people now would laugh at as far as surf breaks. I mean, they're just small, tiny little waves, but I, I love them. And uh, I guess, you know, for my journey into water quality, you see huge plumes every time there's a flood of mud and brown water, many, many hundreds of yards out to sea. And that is just so disturbing growing up and seeing our beautiful coral reefs get covered in that type of sediment. And then just growing up in the rural parts of Big Island, you get to see a lot of native forests and get really inspired by the beauty of our incredible plants and wildlife that only exist here. So I went up to, um, I graduated from Hilo High, um, learned more about natural resource protection at Stanford University and was really lucky to get a job um, right back um, home at the Department of Land and Natural Resources and have been doing native ecosystem protection since. Okay. Thanks so much. Dan, what is your story? How are you um, connected to this work? Well, it's, the short version is um, I learned how to scuba dive. Uh, my first class was on the Great Barrier Reef, I think in 2002 up in Cairns. And um, after, you know, living mostly on the Atlantic uh, in the kind of New York, Connecticut area, that was just kind of mind blowing seeing an ocean like that with the with the fish and the colors and the corals um, instantly I was like I need to know more about this and being kind of prone in the sciences and really liking science at the time um, it was obvious to me that I needed to kind of immerse myself in that and learn more so came out to Hawaii because uh, that was the easiest place to kind of learn and work uh, in the Pacific Ocean for me as a you know U.S. citizen and um, that was about 2005. I pretty much instantly got a job at UH as a research assistant working with um, endemic edible seaweeds and their kind of interactions with invasive algae and water quality and what makes them grow. Um, and that very kind of naturally led me into using seaweed as a, uh, as a bioassay to detect wastewater pollution. And my research group has been doing that since the early 2000s, um, working in the Lahaina area with the whole Lahaina treatment plant facility. And that's kind of exploded into this kind of much larger field that we're in now of using um, seaweed uh, and other, you know, and hydrology and the, the interaction between nearshore ecology and water quality and hydrology and 
um, to determine what are the real driving factors that are kind of uh, influencing our reefs and the diversity um, of them. So I had a message to PhD at the Hawaii Technical Botany Department, um, really focusing on ecosystems and and the, um, how hydrology drives changes on the reef. And so um, that whole, it, towards the end of that, uh, I was began working with Swift Rider and uh, recently in the last year or two took over um, their water quality program as kind of the Oahu chapter coordinator for the Blue Water Task Force, which got me really interested in, in the um, microbiology and the risk factors that, that interact with, um, with humans. Um, and what human risk is and, and what's creating these kind of higher bacterial loads and fecal indicator bacteria levels in the, um, in the near shore environment of Oahu. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm involved in multiple research projects now uh, in the state and um, really focused on water quality, um, uh, the microbiology, the fecal indicator bacteria, and trying to make links as to what are the drivers that influence both reef health, but also human health and the risk of human illness from water quality issues. Okay, great, which I know we'll talk a lot about today. Um, Stuart, how, uh, how have you come to be, become the executive director of VI and what was the path that you took to get to that, to that work? Yep, thank you, Julia. It's, uh, it was a long um, and kind of uh, twisted path, um, but in the seventh grade in Charleston, South Carolina, I first learned to surf. And that same year I had, um, I took a mandatory course in seventh grade um, called Cultures of the Pacific. And it was all about Hawaii and Polynesian culture, which you can imagine how strange that was so long ago in Charleston, South Carolina. But the principal had been a soldier in World War II, fallen in love with Hawaiian and Polynesian culture and taught us everything. So I started dreaming about living in Hawaii early on. And uh, I first made my way out to California and um, used to surf at the famous Malibu Surfrider Beach. And this is where Surfrider got its start because um, there were a lot of big, wealthy homes that were right on the beach that had cesspools. And every time I'd go surfing at Malibu, I'd have this great session. I'd get home and I'd start feeling really sick. I'm like, oh man, what is wrong? And found out that it was these cesspools, you know, right on the ocean. And so I started getting involved with Surfrider um, with Dan and uh, was the Hawaii manager for about 11 years. And then just uh, two years ago, started realizing that, you know, we needed a local nonprofit that was focused on this issue. We had helped, you know, pass laws banning cesspools um, and mandating their conversion by 2050. And then we created one more law, um, Act 132, that basically um, created the cesspool conversion working group for the state. And I was serving on that and realized homeowners need more of a voice here. You know, they've got a, a burden of, you know, maybe 25 to 35 to even $40,000 to convert their cesspools. And there's not a lot of people advocating for them and looking for finances and better technological options. So we, we launched Vi um, and about two years ago and just kind of hit the ground running um, even amidst the, the pandemic, so. Okay, uh, yeah. great. You know, I would love to, to really begin today's show by giving our viewers a kind of a baseline understanding of what the issues really are in our near shore ocean waters at the moment. What are the biggest threats? What are the biggest pollutants? Uh, where are they coming from? Why are they coming? Um, so it would be great. I know each one of you has a sort of a different area of expertise, but if you could just walk us through what you're familiar with, the, the sort of the hazards and the issues. And again, Emma, I'd like to come back and, and start with you. You know, you alluded to the sediment coming down onto the coral reefs, but if you could, could talk a little bit about um, what you witness in the work that you do. Yeah, well, I think that there's a huge amount of focus on runoff and stormwater uh, that's occurring in the urban and agricultural um, areas of Hawaii. But what we fail to notice a lot is that 
about over 80% of our rainfall in Hawaii falls in these forested undeveloped areas. So it's incredibly important that we focus on making sure these forests remain and are healthy to make sure that the rain that falls slowly percolates underground and gets um, infiltrated into our aquifer rather than gets eroded and run off and then eventually into our nearshore waters. And one thing I um, did wanna share is uh, is just a picture of what these reefs look like, um, or sorry, what these forests look like. Hopefully you folks are able to see this um, uh, picture of a native forest. It's just very dense. All that vegetation captures water and then slowly with the mosses and ground cover drips it into the ground. What happens when these forests are lost, um, this is an example on Oahu of pig digging, where instead of that forest, we have just bare ground that has been uprooted by pigs. And then on a larger scale, we can see from helicopters that these pigs can uproot vast acreages across our forests, which from afar might look green, but when you see them up close, you see there's huge areas that have been damaged. And then what happens after that is all that damage comes off and in the south slope of Molokai, for instance, can get horribly um, full of sediment right in their fringing reef because of this um, loss of the forests. And this is an area that doesn't have any really real urban or ag areas. It's just all coming off of this um, forest that has been converted to bare ground. Uh, in fact, this um, USGS has actually determined in this area that the forest or the, the ground is eroding a hundred times faster than natural levels. And so we're aging our, um, our land and we're, you know, just our islands are washing away because of this loss of our native forests that have um, existed for millions of years. So, you know, pigs are a huge problem. Goats, deer, sheep, um, feral cattle are across our, um, forests. And so one of the tools that we have is to fence these areas. And we, um, you can see this picture with a fence going diagonally across the landscape, separating Makua Valley from Makaha Valley. And the incredible difference a fence versus an unfenced area can look like. And unfortunately, we just have really, we really are behind in being able to protect our remaining forests. On Oahu, for instance, we've already lost 80% of our native forest, and only 1% of these forests are fenced. And so in order to keep these forests from further um, uh, receding and being lost, we really need to increase the rate that we are protecting these lands. And so this has a huge implication towards nearshore waters because about 80% of our nearshore waters are tested as impaired and turbidity is by far the main reason why that's um, the, the reason of the impairment. And so sedimentation and this runoff from forests is just a huge part of that and an enormous picture of why, you know, our coral reefs have been suffering from sedimentation. Okay, thank you so much for walking us through that and also for sharing those images. There's you know, very evocative images with us. Um, Dan, I'd like to come to you next. And if you can talk about the sorts of, the sorts of um, pollutants and things that you're seeing that are issues in the near shore ocean waters. Sure, well, um, my research more or less focuses on the impacts of uh, nutrient loading to the coast. And so when I say nutrient loading, I'm talking about, um, uh, nitrogen mainly as kind of uh, the main driver of growth. And you can think of it like um, kind of like your lawn. If uh, you throw fertilizer on your lawn, the lawn grows. And if you don't have um, a lawnmower, it's going to keep growing typically. And so we can think of the fish on the reef as kind of a lawnmower and your cesspools and, um, and agriculture and other nitrogen sources as the fertilizer. And so if these two things aren't in balance, you don't have enough fish on the reef um, to keep the, the grass down or the seaweed down and, um, and you add too much fertilizer, 
um, it can easily get out of balance. And that's when we get kind of this overgrowth of invasive seaweeds. And these are typically, they could be native seaweeds. Um, they could be foreign uh, alien species, but they're basically seaweeds that uh, grow uh, really well where they are. They are able to grow in all kinds of salinities and changing salinity regimes. They're able to grow under low uh, um, additions of nutrients and high sun levels and low tides and high tides. And, and they basically can outcompete um, the native species on the reef. So when we have um, issues like excessive nutrient loading from cesspools or, or golf courses, uh, agricultural fields like sugarcane uh, used to be a major issue on Maui. And I have a lot of data showing the impact of that. Um, yeah, you get this kind of off balance. And what you get is one or two dominant species that do really well and they dominate the reef. And it changes a reef that used to have 100 algal species and lots of species of fish to one or two species of algae that blanket the reef. And the native fish aren't there because you know you just took out, you just took their favorite dinner. Uh, it's gone now. So they're not eating the invasive species very much. And you get basically a monoculture cornfield approach to a coral reef. And uh, all the pukas are gone because they're full of seaweed. So you get, there's not a lot of space for different kind of fish and um, other invertebrates to hide. So a lot of my work has really been kind of determining the drivers of that, the land use issues behind that. And so it's basically looking on land, looking upslope and seeing, okay, is there a sugarcane field here? Was there a sugarcane field here? Is there a dense amount of cesspools? Is there an injection well for wastewater distribution? And then looking at the ocean and seeing like, what's going on here? Is it a diverse reef? Are there native species on the reef? Is it uh, a monoculture cornfield situation? And typically what we find is when there, when particularly, um, this was shown really clearly on Maui, when we have large scale agriculture, like the sugarcane industry, which luckily is now kind of gone for the most part, um, you'd have huge amounts of nitrogen flowing into the reef and a very unhealthy reef. Um, and so if you can think about the North Shore of Maui, that's kind of the Paiea area, um, Kite Beach area. And then just to the left in the Kahului region near Hilo, oh, sorry, Hilo Harbor, near Kahului Harbor, um, you have a, an injection well for wastewater that's doing four and a half million gallons a day. And interestingly, the reef out in front of the injection wells, which are only literally, literally 50 feet away from the ocean or less, um, are full of fleshy zoanthids. Uh, this is kind of a coral-like organism. So not seaweed can't even grow there uh, in this regime. It's these fleshy weird zoanthids that blanket the, um, the reef like a mat. So that's kind of an example of, of what I've been working at. However, I do recognize that um, that sediment is also quite a large issue that can uh, affect the reef in different ways. And so I think we'll be definitely touching on that more today, especially with Emma's input. And, um, but yeah, my, my research is, is kind of more from an algal physiology point of view, how seaweed responds to nutrients, how the different ones compete against each other to create um, you know, the, the, the different states of reefs that we see. Okay, okay, great. And, and Stuart, what, what can you share with us about creating this picture for the viewers of what's happening in, in the water? Yeah, so basically, you know, we have two major sources of poor water, water quality, stormwater runoff um, that Emma and, and Dan were just talking about. And then you have this input from 88,000 cesspools across the state Hawaii is Nokooi number one in the number of cesspools per capita in the country. Um, there's only one place in the country on Long Island that has more cesspools than, than we have here in New York. Um, so you have 88,000 cesspools and they're discharging 53 million gallons per day of raw untreated sewage into the ground in our groundwater. And so it seems, you know, like maybe individually you think my house isn't contributing that much, but collectively that's more than, you know, the largest uh, sewage spill in Hawaii's history in 2006. Um, and this is what I'd like to remind people. If for those who remember when it shut down Waikiki and the Alawai was just pumped full of 48 million gallons of raw sewage that overflowed and one person died and uh, you know, it made international headlines. 
um, we have more than that going into our groundwaters every day. And so we're trying to focus on ways to um, convert those cesspools, um, find more efficient technology, and um, you know, also make sure that, so a lot of people are like, oh, well, we should just convert, <clears throat> excuse me, convert our cesspool into a septic tank, um, a septic system with a leach field. But that still doesn't take care of the nutrient pollution that Dan is talking about. So that is a very serious issue because that's what can, you know, cover the reefs, lead to algal overgrowth and really, you know, hurt fish populations um, and just the local near shore um, ecology. So a related matter that kind of Dan mentioned is also the injection wells. Um, you know, we were part of a 10 year effort with the Surfrider Foundation um, challenging uh, in, in Maui County, the injection wells, and they went all the way up to the Supreme Court and they, you know, they sided with, you know, Earth Justice and this coalition of groups that this is, you know, uh, is affecting the reefs off of, you know, the west side of Maui. So we have a lot of injection wells and large capacity cesspools as well around Hawaii. And so we're looking at all those issues. Can you define exactly, what is an injection well? Yeah. An injection well is a little hard to define. Um, like a cesspool is basically just a hole in the ground. An injection well is, is they're all different types. types. So sometimes it can just be a large hole in the ground where you have municipal, like Maui County on the west side, pumping water into it. It's treated wastewater, but it still has nutrients and, and other things. Um, to other places in Maalaya where they're pumping just partially treated wastewater into these things. And, you know, with the volcanic soils, um, these are just going right on to the reef. So we're working with a group of partners in Malaya, and one of them is a lifelong resident there. And he said, over the last 20 years, scientific studies have shown that they've gone from about 80% coral cover, um, excuse me, 70 to 80% coral cover to about 8%. Um, so it has made a huge difference. He's like, it's unrecognizable. The reefs of my, you know, youth are kind of gone. Um, so that's what we're fighting against. We have to really be aware of how serious that issue is because these coral reefs are so valuable in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I also want to add in Ma'alaya, there's been enormous amounts of fires across thousands and thousands of acres that have completely decimated the forest and created enormous amount of sediment runoff after um, when rains wash all that bare ground off into the soil. So the, the thing that is uh, unique about the upland forested uh, issues and the erosion that's occurring there is unlike the wastewater issues or even some of the stormwater urban um, issues, they can't be regulated. You know, you can't sue a goat, you can't sue a myconia weed, all these things. You know, the, the picture I showed of the, the fenced area in Makaha versus Makua Valley and the completely barren slopes, that would have been the most enormous violation of environmental conservation district laws if a human had raised that slope down to the, the dirt. But you can't sue that, you can't pass a law against it. And so unfortunately, the, the main way that we can work on protecting our forests is through additional funding for protection of um, you know, fencing, invasive um, weed control, replanting, fire prevention. And that's gonna be the, the way that we get out of these, um, these problems and also prevent even worse problems as the forest continues to disappear without management. But luckily, it's it's actually relatively inexpensive. I mean, you hear about some wastewater plants costing, you know, many hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. But for some of our um, projects, like to fence the entire east side or yeah, east half of the West Maui Mountains, where Stuart was talking about, from Ma'alaya all the way to um, Waihe'e, for instance, protecting twenty thousand acres, it only would cost eight million dollars to make sure that area is not being um, degraded by deer and goats and, and pigs. So comparatively, we can have a huge impact 
across very small acreages. And a lot of the governmental and private agencies from County of Maui to um, Kamehameha schools to the state of Hawaii are contributing uh, and a lot of federal agencies too. So that's, that's where we were seeking solutions. So where, you know, you mentioned that on Oahu, it's, it's the, it looks like the fencing is at 1%, which is just so incredibly low. Where, can you tell us a little bit about right at the moment where things are at with, with fencing? And, it, you know, it, is that um, the, the most important solution? Is that the, it's the first that thing the that we need best? to do. Yeah, fencing is the first step for protecting these forests because the hooved animals that are all not native to Hawaii, not even um, pigs, are uh, just extremely destructive to these forests. And if and as these animals continue to roam across these areas, and a lot of them are really remote, there's very little hunting pressure. There's they can reproduce and create twelve piglets per you know year. Basically, it's just they're incredibly uh, fecund. And so without a fence, there's no way we can protect these forests. So that's the first step. Um, and unfortunately, we're very, um, we really have not protected a lot of areas. Statewide, we have protected 17% of our native forests. So the remainder are all being continuously degraded every single day and receding and receding and receding by these feral animals. We have a goal um, by 2030 to protect 30% of our native forests. And that's largely being contributed to by state legislative funding for, for fencing. And so we're really trying to reach that goal. The next thing that needs to happen is do some work for um, removing invasive weeds that oftentimes are spread by hoved animals. And then another major task in some of our drier areas is to put fire breaks or um, other measures to protect these areas from wildfires. In some areas, we can actually replant and sequester a lot of carbon and have a lot of benefits by um, if, they're, if they are fenced. And so that's another major task that is needed for forest conservation in Hawaii. Emma, why is the fencing going so slowly? Well, I think that it's definitely a lack of funding um, and that, you know, we have a very limited budget for environmental protection. And again, it's not something that can be necessarily regulated or legislative. You can't, it really has to be a, a funding issue. And it, you know, hasn't really, yeah, I think that, that funding is the, the main limiting factor. Okay. So in terms of, if, if you had the money, then putting the programs together and actually putting the fences in place would be possible with a lot of the topography and the geography. So it's really just an issue of the money. Yeah, and we have plans for exactly, you know, where those, that 30% would look like and how to get there. And we do have crews that are able to put that, those fences out there, but yeah, we just are not, uh, we don't necessarily have the funding available to accomplish that. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we also need to do, the weed control, the planting, that sort of thing. So it's, it's always a, a limiting limitation for us. Okay, okay. Um, Dan, going back to some of the things that you were talking about, about this heavy load of nitrogen in the waters um, and the, the kind of the, the monoculture on the reef that happens as a result of that. You know, maybe we could talk a little bit about what are the possible solutions. I also, I wanted to point um, Bob Burke, who was an environmental scientist uh, looking at ocean quality in Hawaii for a number of decades, wrote a piece on May 4th 
of this year that ran in the Star Advertiser called To Clean Up Oahu's Coastal Waters, focused on storm drains. And we'll post that in the chat. And that's a, a, a really interesting, he also did an, a pretty extensive presentation looking at uh, the 670 miles of storm drains that exist in Hawaii. So as I understand it, those are a pretty efficient mechanism for carrying a significant number of pollutants right into our nearshore ocean waters, right? Because the rains come down, they're very heavy. We've got a lot of these antiquated 50 year old concrete drainage systems that are very efficient at just carrying whatever they encounter right into the water. So um, I'd like to direct viewers to look at, at, at Bob's piece um, but also, Dan, I know you're aware of that work and, and you've also done it yourself, some of it. And um, what, how, how do we handle this issue of storm drains and what's in the storm drains? Good question. So you're correct. I, I have had a fair amount of experience with uh, the stormwater system and um, for my day job at Element Environmental, I, I actually monitor the water coming, going into and coming out of these systems for the city and county of Honolulu, for the Department of Defense, et cetera. Um, and over time, you know, when you, when you step back and you kind of throw all the data together and look at what the trends are, um, it's, it becomes pretty clear that as the uh, turbidity or the, what we call a total suspended solids, that's like, the particles that are suspended in the water, how brown it looks essentially. As you see that, that, that go up, as the water gets browner, it has a lot more pollutants in it. It has more nitrogen. It has definitely it has more dissolved uh, heavy metals like copper and zinc. And um, so you have nutrients and heavy metals, particularly flowing every time you get a decent rain um, you know, into the storm drains. And then, yeah, the, the system's designed to just throw it straight out onto the reef as quick as possible, and um, and so it's a major it's a major issue. And the problem is that even we've learned, you know, looking at these systems at airports, uh, on military bases, is that um, even if you have a parking lot where you just park cars, you don't have industrial activity. Even a parking lot um, with a grassy area will fail to meet um, the uh, water quality standards for typically nutrients and these heavy metals. And so it's either that the, um, that the standards are too, too high in the sense that people just can't, you just, cities can't meet these standards or we're just not dealing with the water in the appropriate way. And so I think both are really true. The standards are set very high and they're almost unattainable, unattainable and that, you know, the Department of Health generally doesn't prosecute people based on these because they know it's just, it's an issue. Everybody's failing. They don't really know exactly what to do about it. So the solution has turned from, let's get the water out into the reef to retain it on site. And if you look at how the city's building and, the, and their building codes and, and how, the, how the, you know, the federal government, the military and the city and county are all um, in their construction process, they all have what's called low impact development. And, Basically, the idea of low impact development is keeping the water on site and infiltrating it into the ground instead of having it flowing straight off um, down these channelized conduits or pipes into the ocean. So when it comes to construction, what that means, they're putting in permeable pavers, permeable parking lots, where literally you can dump a truck of water onto a parking spot and it goes straight into the ground if it's maintained well. And so I think that um, in addition to installing um, better BMPs or best management practice, practices and the devices into storm drains. So fabrics that catch, you know, can reduce 90% of the nitrogen and phosphorus and catch particulates. Um, other ways of settling out the sediment before it gets back into the storm drain system. So there's all these fairly low tech and high tech devices we can put into the storm drains, but the best thing is to develop spaces where the water runs into a retention basin or an infiltration basin and it goes back into the ground. And so that will kind of keep the water immediately off the reef and it allows for natural processes like grass and plants to reabsorb those 
um, pollutants, and then we can, you know, maintain them in the plant form, which is a lot easier than than maintaining water quality on the reef once it gets there. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up was that uh, through the Surfrider Foundation's monitoring efforts and some of the work I've done alongside that, it's becoming more clear that our kind of antiquated storm drain systems may actually be catching wastewater from cesspools and potentially leaky pipes from municipal systems. And the way this works is when you get large amounts of water and the ground saturated, um, things in the soil tend to move a lot more. And so if you get a large rain event, your cesspool area or your septic system is saturated, the storm drain system um, will actually accept that water because there's, there's less pressure inside the storm drain system. The water wants to get out fast. It flows into the pipes through cracks that are made by roots and age and ground motion or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm thinking is that there's a pretty good amount of data uh, coming in that's showing we're actually getting wastewater coming from our storm drain systems that are going right on, on the reef. And I suspect that it's from these kind of on-site sewage disposal systems like cesspools, like um, septic systems, potentially broken um, municipal sewer pipes, et cetera. So there's some debate back and forth about this, but I think um, one of the things I would like to do in the near future is do a study that directly looks at this. Yeah. Um, I want to share a comment from one of our viewers, Ingrid. She says, when I was living in Southern California, there was a huge storm wastewater education program in the schools at every environmental event and with the general public. Every storm drain in Geelong streets was painted to warn not to put Opala in storm drains. Um, I know that one of the points that Bob Burke was making is that actually Hawaii, you, you know, you were talking about some of the ways that uh, the management and the design can be improved so that the stormwater doesn't just go straight into the ocean, but there, there are all these things that can be done. And so his point is that when you look at Europe, when you look at the East Coast of North America, the West Coast of North America, that we are far behind everyone. Um, and for an island, that's doubly ironic. Um, are you are you seeing any any uh, attempts now? Any anything happening now that that leads you to believe that we're moving in the direction of really improving what's happening with the stormwater drainage system and the runoff? Well, you know, my experience working with these kind of government agencies and being pretty you know neck deep in their uh, what they call SWPCPs or their stormwater pollution control plans. Um, things are moving in the right direction. It is slow, um, but every five years their permits get renewed and it's stricter and it's not, and there's, you know, backsliding is, is pretty much not acceptable in the regulatory world. So things will get better. They are getting better. Things are getting stricter. Um, so take like the airport for existence, HNL, they have a massive stormwater program that has uh, multiple pieces of it. And um, in addition to the construction side, the low impact development, they, they have to uh, they put placards on their storm drains. They have to number their storm drains. And the placards say, you know, this goes straight to the ocean. Don't put trash in here. So things like that um, are happening. And, and you're beginning to see it more and more in these kind of larger programs like the Department of Defense um, you know, programs. That, the uh, every large government agency, highways, uh, harbors, um, airports, they all have these massive stormwater pollution uh, programs. Uh, another company I used to work with um, in virus services training center, they have like a, you know, a 20 person team that is dedicated to highway stormwater management plan and highways has another 20 people, one for one person. So that's 40 person team that's actively monitoring highways, storm drain systems, counting the amount of trash going in there and coming up with ways to figure out how to uh, improve the water coming out of their system. So I, I think that you know these things are, are being looked at, the permits are getting more strict. The, the awareness within that those communities is there. Um, I think that we are lacking in public awareness, however, I think that could definitely be improved 
as part of all these programs, there is an educational component that is a big part of it. Um, but I think we're still behind when it comes to kind of like general public island wide awareness of, you know, when you wash your car in your driveway and it goes straight into the storm drain, it's going into your stream and that stream is going into the ocean. So there's things like that that are, are still allowed. But, um, you know, people don't, don't think that like, hey, I'm all that soap and that that wheel shiner stuff that can't be good for your stream is is going straight in, into the stream in the ocean. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I wanted to add of where we might be going in the future. Oahu is putting together some um, stormwater utility fee discussions, and that's really going to be a way to incentivize people to have less pervious or impervious surfaces like pavements and, and transition more to the um, the you know grasses or pervious surfaces that can soak up some of these infiltrate you know uh, infiltrate a lot of this these pollutants that Dan was mentioning and one thing that's really beneficial about you know going back to it seems like I have to keep on talking about pigs and, and goats and that sort of thing, but there actually was just a study that we um, came in that says that a forest that has pigs um, and ungulate presence infiltrates water 25% less than a, uh, un, than a fenced forest that's protected from, from um, these ungulates. And so the rate of this infiltration is not just important in the, the urban areas, it's also extremely important in these, these upland areas that we want to make sure are able to, to um, slowly infiltrate rather than, than run off. And so it's just, I guess, something that is important across the entire landscape and hopefully with more focus on that the city and county of Honolulu is doing through their stormwater utility program and the work that we and our partners are doing with Department of Land and Natural Resources to protect our forests and the um, wastewater work. There are a lot of um, innovations and, and progress that's being made. Here's a, a question from Maxine. She says, I could be mistaken, but isn't there a meeting to get public input on stormwater management? Do any of you know of something? Yeah, like there have been meetings across the, utility, the island. There's been a lot of, yeah. kind of public input. Yeah. I just wanted to add one thing real quick about the um, infiltration versus runoff. N not only is it a kind of, you know, long-term ocean health issue, but it's a long-term um, groundwater resources issue. So mm -hmm. if we're going to have a sustainable aquifer and have water, you know, into the future, we need to be con thinking about the best ways to, to capture that water and, and letting it run into the ocean is... <laughs> Not, not one of those things. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of a, a, cure, a funny thing that we were talking about water quality in forests because a lot of um, the focus on forest protection is specifically because it recharges our aquifer. And in Hawaii, we actually were the first um, state in the entire nation to create a forestry agency back in 1903 because we had the most direct connection between the loss of our forests and the streams and the springs drying up and not being able to service the agriculture that was being occurring there. And so the sugar planter interests lobbied to create a forestry management agency to protect this water. So it's a real, beyond the water quality issue, it's just essential that we keep our forests in place to make sure that we have fresh water here in Hawaii. Yeah. Im and I worked on a campaign called The Rain Follows the Forest. And, you know, we're lucky in Hawaii that we have this indigenous wisdom. This was, you know, a Hawaiian saying that, you know, is so just shows this, this wisdom that's, you know, correlating exactly with the science now that, you know, as our forest goes, so is, does our ability to keep the water in the ground. We're getting less rain. And so one of the big issues is, you know, is climate change and sea level rise. And so the more we lose our forests, the more we lose the ability to retain that water. And it is starting to threaten, you know, our drinking water supplies. And then on the lower end, when you have all these cesspools infiltrating, 
you know, because this is a sole source aquifer, we get 95% of our water uh, from it, you know, then you're, there are certain areas like upcountry Maui and Kahalu on Oahu, where those cesspools, it's been documented, there is nitrogen in the, in the drinking water, elevated levels, and, and that's not healthy. Um, so, you know, it really comes down to, you know, a real, we've got to protect our water supply. Um, Mark, Mark Twain once said, whiskey's for drinking, water is for fighting. Um, because whoever controlled water rights and had the water, I mean, that's the word for wealth in Hawaiian is bye bye. You know, it, they understood just how important having clean water and access to it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's, Stuart, let's, let's talk about the cesspools. Let's, let's, um, I know you, you went into that in some depth in the essay that you did for us, and we've put a link um, in the chat to your essay. But, you know, 88,000 cesspools, um, can you lay out for us the picture of what needs to happen for, for that to be able to change in a significant enough way that it's not having a negative impact on, on the health of groundwater and ocean water? Yeah, you know, I'd say um, let's let's dive into the issue. But I had a friend that fell in an abandoned cesspool, so I, you know, don't want to um, you know, use that metaphor because it's also a safety issue. Just physically, these abandoned cesspools, you know, they're they're not isolated stories of people falling into them. But as far as converting these cesspools and reducing the nutrient levels and protecting our reefs and water supply you know, it's gonna to have to work on three different levels. And one is the individual wastewater system at each property. There's some places like in upcountry Maui where the slope and the soil, you can't do community scale things. It's just too expensive and too difficult with the topography and the, and the soil. Um, and so you have to work on the individual home level. But then the next level are like community scale situations where if there's an area in Kapa'a where we can hook up, you know, 500 homes and do, you know, treat it, you know, you don't have to do a big municipal plant that's so expensive, you know, it can cost tens and tens of millions of dollars, um, but you can do smaller ones and they're, they're companies that can, can do this. And so we're exploring that um, decentralized solutions. And then in certain areas like Waimanalo that are near sewer lines, you know, somehow trying to find the money to extend those, especially for beach lots where it's affecting the, you know, Dan's done a lot of research in Waimanalo where we can see elevated nitrogen levels, um, looking at that aspect to it. And even if it weren't hooking up sewer, there are different ways you can do that um, without digging up the streets and doing massive gravity lines that are very expensive and disruptive. Um, so those are the kind of three areas with before the pandemic, it was challenging financially. After the pandemic, the counties really just don't have a lot of money to do this. Um, Oahu is a little bit the exception um, because they have a consent degree and they've been collecting money um, to upgrade those. But, um, you know, I think it's really going to depend on federal money coming in. And so we're lucky in that, you know, our two senators and our two representatives are very aware of this issue. We've had long discussions with their offices and, you know, President Biden's um, infrastructure bill, you know, which looks like it's heading towards a, you know, compromise right near a trillion dollars. This is going to be essential. We have put this off for way too long. And now it's time to finally deal with these things because it has as sea level rises, you're gonna get even more and more inundation of these cesspools and even septic systems where it's just coming right into the cesspool. Um, and that's very dangerous. That's gonna hurt our water supply and our bottom line of tourism. You know, just people are not gonna to wanna to come where they're polluted beaches. So I think it's a three prong approach and the feds are gonna be really a, a key, key player in, in making this happen. And now we have the urgency of climate change where there's just unanimous agreement among scientists and urban planners and, you know, municipal planners everywhere. It's like, this is, we have to take care of this. 
Yeah. Have you ever looked to at, to try and get a sense of what percentage overall of Hawaii's buildings are on either cesspool or septic? What, how many is it like 20%, 30%, 40%? I'm sure it varies from island to island. Mm -hmm. But in general, how, how many of our structures are not connected to a sewage treatment plant? Right. The, the good thing is that any like a house that's over five bedrooms, um, everything up to five bedrooms, the state department of health oversees those individual wastewater systems. If it's more than that, which we calculate 200 gallons per day per bedroom, if it's over a thousand gallons, it is pretty well monitored. So that's the good news. So buildings, condos, you know, all of those, the EPA has authority and they can say, you know, this has got to stop and they can impose fines, um, but they can't do that with individual wastewater systems because DOH has oversight of that. So that's a little bit of the good news is that, you know, large capacity cesspools, those are over a thousand gallons per day of, of daily flow. Those are being converted and you've seen it in the news. There were maybe, most of them were converted in 2005, six, seven. And then, you know, they're found some recent ones that weren't converted, but then the feds can come in and say, look, you're gonna be fine. You need to start working on this. And so, you know, an example, an exception kind of to that rule is like in Ma'alaya where you have 10 large condo buildings. They have treatment system because they're large and they're over a certain level, but they can't fully treat all of that. And so they're pumping the partially treated wastewater into injection wells. There are like 26 injection wells in that area. And that's partly why we've seen this loss of coral reef cover um, because injection wells are really just a large form of cesspool. You know, there's more treatment going on in the front end, but it's a direct route to the shoreline. Okay. I want to just jump in. I've got some recent stats here for you since you're asking about numbers, Julia. Um, this is preliminary results from um, from a report that we're writing to, uh, to the group that Stuart's a part of, to the um, cesspool conversion working group and the legislature. This was a study funded on Act 132 uh, funding. And um, the numbers I'm looking at, again, this is preliminary, the report's not finished yet, but um, the numbers I've seen for a statewide total are about 95,500 cesspools statewide. Um, and with the total kind of on-site sewage disposal system, so this includes septic systems, aerobic units, whatever, every type of on-site system at a little over 116,000. So um, that's 95,500 cesspools from a total of 116,000 or so. Uh, when you look at the nitrogen discharge rates that are calculated from that, 85% of discharge from those is coming from cesspools. And 89% and of the phosphorus discharge is coming from cesspools. Wow. So that gives you a little bit closer look at what actually is going on. And just for, um, I did a GIS uh, quick assessment once of the island of Oahu. Based on land area alone, I think it was like 80% of Oahu was, was, did not have access to municipal sewers. And that's where the, the sewer system and the laterals existed. I mean, that includes the forest, you know, and, and some of the mountainous regions of Oahu. But that's, when you think about, you think Oahu must have sewer service, it's populated, there's a lot of people, 80% of the land does not have sewer nearby. So go figure. Yeah. And a, a really huge reason why these, you know, there's, I see some questions about why we have injection wells and, you know, why aren't we hooked up to all these things? It's a lot of the the cost is the is the huge concern for all these various things and all these things that Stuart had mentioned the different tiers of solutions that are needed and one thing that we wanted to um, that we have been working on is there is a new guidance from the EPA called integrated planning that allows municipalities to look at all of the different threats to water quality next to each other rather than in their own silos. And I think this is a really very promising way that um, different, the different counties across the state can 
can look at how we can deal with our um, water quality issues and look at the cost benefits of various solutions. And the EPA has allowed the different um, the municipalities to use this integrated plan to then adjust some of their permits and requirements and consent decrees and that sort of thing for their existing permits. So there is a, a incentive for the, the municipalities to do that. But you know, the, the coral doesn't care whether the nitrogen is coming from a pig or from a human or from the soil. It's just coming from, you know, something and it's hurting them. So I think we have to take a really um, broad look at our water quality issues and stop being so siloed and integrated planning is actually the, the regulatory um, way that provides that path. So it's really exciting that it's out there. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And I, I would agree with Emma that, you know, there are solutions. Some people are like, oh, it's so complicated, so expensive. There are no solutions. There are very, when you talk about like the amount of money needed to do fencing, it is really relatively small for the incredible, incredible benefit it provides. And the same with, you know, converting every cesspool across the state and over half of them are in the big island is very, very expensive. But if you went into certain areas, some of these priority areas and converted the ones near the shore, it's going to reap benefits. And so it's, it's very doable. I think we just need you know, people reaching out to their legislators at the state level, at the federal level and county level and saying, this is important to us. You know, this is about our environment, our public health um, and you know, our water supply in, in Hawaii. So, um, there are solutions we just need to, to you know, educate and lay, raise the level of awareness like Dan was saying. Yeah. Stuart and Emma, you both mentioned the term consent decree. Can you explain for the viewers what you're talking about there? Emma, you want to take this one or you want me? Yeah. Um, go, go ahead, Stuart. Uh, so the consent decree was something that was uh, put in practice um, you know, after long years and hard work and negotiation by a number of environmental groups, including the Sierra Club um, and the County of Hawaii and uh, excuse me, the county, city and county of Honolulu um, to say, look, the sewer systems are not working and that sewage spill in 2006 really exemplified how bad the situation had gotten. So they've done a lot of great work. It's forced them to upgrade a lot of the sewer lines um, and so it's a, it's a federal consent decree where they have to make sure they make progress and show that progress over a number of years. What integrated planning allows that Emma was talking about was, you know, these things were done 10 years ago and what was thought the best solution at that time might not be the best solution at this time. And so they want to, you know, there's a lot of effort to completely redo the Sand Island Wastewater Treatment Plant, one of the largest um, in the state, and but it's at a cost of like two billion, and there, you know, we believe that there are more affordable ways to do that that would cost a fraction of that price. And if you use some of that money, you know, to do fencing, to convert cesspools, under the integrated planning approach, the EPA says yes. If if the parties agree, then that's a better use of the time, effort, and money for the county. And so we're just trying to introduce this. Um, but the, the mayor and um, city council members are very, you know, seem to be very, very open to this. Um, and so it's something, you know, a number of them are exploring. Okay, okay. You know, I wanna, I wanna bring in a question from, from one of our viewers, Audrey. Uh, and she's asking, this is connect more with groundwater, um, but she says, any thoughts on the fuel tank drainage issue at Red Hill? How does this fuel leakage possibility play into our aquifer water supply situation? I can probably take that one, Julia, if you want. Great. So as a, you know, day job is my environmental, an environmental scientist, I am fairly familiar with the situation at Red Hill. Um, and, uh, there, there has been a lot of, you know, concern about this in the past. Obviously, there's a lot of fuel being stored over um, the aquifer there. That uh, and the Navy's aware of that that it, that is the Navy's aquifer. That's what they use at Pearl Harbor for their water supply. So they're definitely concerned. Um, 
about it as well. Uh, but I think if you if you kind of take a step back and look at kind of the bigger picture, um, there, if you if you took say the fuel spill from a leak from one of the many tanks there, um, and and that got you know into the into the aquifer, it probably would stay at the top of the aquifer. And um, if you if you even took that whole fuel spill, divided that by the amount of fuel, I'm sorry, the amount of water in the aquifer, you'd still end up with a very very small amount uh, a percent of fuel per water. Yes, there there may be fuel in there, um, but it might still be below regulatory levels because the, the aquifer is so massive, and the fuel spill would only be so large. Um, that being said, the uh, it's, it's unlikely that would happen. There is a lot of systems in place, a lot of BMPs uh, within Red Hill to mitigate any such thing. So I, I think it's a little bit of an over-concern, um, honestly, just from being familiar with, with the system and, and, uh, and the hydrology involved. Um, so that's at least my opinion. Emma and Stuart, do either of you wanna discuss this, what's happening at Red Hill? Any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say, you know, I've been following and, and supporting Sierra Club's work on this and, and raising awareness. And I think sometimes, you know, not dealing with these things and pushing them down the road can have make the consequences so much more expensive when you have a reactive approach. And so the proactive approach is just let's take care of this. Let's make sure that it's the best quality is so much more um efficient and smart in the long run because you're going to save money and it's the same with you know cesspools and stormwater runoff you know when you're proactive and one thing we didn't mention was I saw in the comments was you know these are also excellent potential um, avenues for workforce development you know we could have we've estimated there could be up to 2,000 jobs created just focusing on converting cesspools in Hawaii and you know hundreds and hundreds more doing fencing around the state you know that Emma's done some research on and these are good green jobs you know that we talk about the green passport and such and we're kind of over capacity with the amount of tourists here and it's it's taking its toll on the environment and I think the pandemic really revealed to us that we need to protect our home and you know sometimes we defer to the economic engine of tourism but I think everybody a local person was like okay this is this is something we need to reconsider. We want a healthy economy, of course, but we can also have better paying jobs if we diversify and take care of some of these environmental concerns. Yeah, so that's a perfect segue to, to I'd like to ask each one of you, um, you know, we've been talking for a little over an hour now, to talk about how people can, can best be involved. Because I think what, you know, what you're saying, that whole idea of sort of protecting our environment and, and all of us just about go to the sea, right? We go to the sea, we commune with the sea and we understand, we can feel um, when the sea is, is not clean, um, is not healthy. And so if you can each offer our viewers suggestions, ideas about ways that they can become involved um, to try and make a difference and to try and see things move in a better direction, what, what advice would you offer? And Emma, can I start with you? Sure. I think that the, the forest component of this is largely needing um, viewers to, to support additional funding for protection of our forests and legislative or county or um, federal uh, efforts to, in some cases, there might be new fees or that sort of thing, but understand that it's really necessary to do some of these really important and long-term benefits for our environment that will really increase the quality of life here in Hawaii and make sure that future costs are not um, had. For instance, there's been a lot of studies showing how the protection of our forests is actually very cost effective for preventing us from having to pay extra water fees in the future because we're going to have more desalination plants if we um, if we lose our forests. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, when people are concerned about, you know, taxes or fees or that sort of thing for some of these environmental programs, they have to realize that actually the environment in a lot of cases saves them money in a lot of ways. And when we lose, when we hurt our environment, when we have to clean things up or we have to deal with the loss of these amazing natural resources like our coral reefs, we actually become much more impoverished and we can't even attract the tourists to begin with. And so our economy falls apart. So it's just so important for viewers to just support programs that um, are helping the environment. And the other um, advice I would give is, you know, if, if Dan or Stuart aren't, aren't gonna cover it is the impervious surfaces, that's a, a huge one and try to minimize your own uh, uh, paving of your property. And then the other thing is to just volunteer for events that help plant trees and remove weeds and do all these other th sorts of general things that will help our environment and get involved and, and learn about your backyard, basically. Okay. All right, thanks. Dan, what, what advice do you have? What suggestions do you have for people who want to get involved in some way with this? Okay, well, briefly, I have just a couple. Uh, the first advice is keep spending time in nature because if you get disconnected, uh, it's over. <laughs> so go surfing, go swimming, go hiking, play in nature. Um, secondly, get involved in a nonprofit that you think is doing good work. You know, go to some beach cleanups with surf rider or sustainable coastlines. Um, go pull seaweed with uh, Malama Mauna Lua uh, down in Hawaii Kai and, and, uh, and try to replant that reef with coral. Um, do things that you think are important and that you think are fun and get you outside and connecting with your kids and your community. Um, but honestly, from my work with surf rider over the last few years and the direction that all this is going, beach cleanups are not the answer. They are a good awareness and educational device. And I you know, encourage you to go because it is a lot of fun and you do feel like you did something in the day. You got a big bag of trash and it's awesome. And you get a sandwich and maybe a pair of slippers if you're lucky, um, but it's not the answer. And so really, um, once you get to the point where you've done enough beach cleanups and the trash is still coming onto the beach, the next step, is to get involved with the, with the legislative process. And Hawaii makes it so easy to put your, um, your thoughts to bills. You can support uh, legislation by a click of a button. Um, and, uh, and it matters because, you know, I've been involved with Surfrider and our legislative efforts for the last few years. And it's, there's many bills that go through that no one really knows about, but they're important bills. Uh, whether it's, you know, plastic bag bans or what have you. And you have a few like very corporate lobbyists that are on one side of the bench and they're bringing lots of heat, and lots of money to the game. But what the grassroots folks have is, is numbers. And then when you come with numbers, uh, especially when you come with like high school kids, they're like, hi, Mr. Legislator, this is my first time uh, talking to the legislative process. Um, and I really support this bill. They, the, everything stops and they listen. And so it's about getting involved um, in that process, whether it's one click of a support button or writing some testimony or showing up uh, and, and actually talking in, in person as you used to be able to do or on Zoom or whatever it is, it's, it's get involved uh, in that process because really that's where things end up changing. Fourthly, once, you know, in the middle of all that, talk about it. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, tell them how excited you are um, and the kind of things that you do at home to reduce your impact on, on the planet. And uh, pretty soon it'll be, it'll be pretty cool to be doing that stuff. So I think that's my four pronged approach to changing the world, I guess. Okay, that's great, that's great. Stuart, suggestions that you have for people who really are passionate about this and, and wanna do something. Yeah, thank you, Julia. I, you know, I would echo um, what Emma and Dan both said. At Surfrider, we started something called Civics is Sexy, and we just really kind of taught people about the legislative process. And Hawaii's lucky in that, you know, capital.hawaii.gov is one of the best and one of the earlier um, 
systems, online systems across the country that was really a breakthrough. Um, and so it is easy to get involved. Um, we can put that in the chat. It's, it's, it's super important. And then, you know, as far as we're concerned, we're, we're trying to make sanitation sexy again. Not that it was ever sexy in the first place, but, um, you know, when I started in the plastic pollution movement 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, now 12 years ago, I mean, no one was talking about it. And it was a marginal issue at best. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, you know, we get frustrated and we say, God, we can't change things. The problems are too big and, you know, politics is corrupt, but we worked with our politician and we worked with a coalition of groups and we passed some of the best laws in the entire country reducing plastic pollution. Um, you know, when I left Surfrider, we had just passed Bill 40, which was one of the top um, plastic, single use plastic reduction bills in the entire country. So I know for a fact that it can work. I know that it's frustrating. It seems like it can be hopeless at times, but if we, focus our efforts on these things, we can make big changes. And I feel like we're at that place with wastewater right now that we were 10 years ago with plastics. Mm. Is that now we're part of an international coalition of groups called the Ocean Sewage Alliance. We're also part of a national coalition called the Decentralized Wastewater Innovation Cohort. Um, and people are talking about this. It's in the news, the feds are talking about it and we're trying to get you know, infrastructure funding. So like Dan said, get involved um, with a local nonprofit. We would love to have you. We need volunteers at, at, at Vi. And, but it doesn't matter what you do, just get involved and get into nature and realize how important it is for our well-being and our health and our future. Okay. Well, I really, I want to thank all three of you for coming on today and to help people understand what is happening in our beloved ocean. Um, give them a sense of the, the, all, all of the different issues and, and all of the different ways in which they might become involved in helping to turn this around. So thanks to each one of you. And I imagine that there might be some point in the future where we would all come together again for a follow-up show where we can look at what's happening. And hopefully, Emma, you'll be able to tell us you're up to 50% fencing and there won't be any invasive algae on the reefs anymore. And um, we'll be looking at maybe 100 cesspools only across the state. So anyway, goals to shoot for. But thank you all so much for giving us this really detailed information and picture of things. And I want to thank all of the viewers for joining us today, for staying with us, for all of your comments and questions. We will be back two Wednesdays from now with the next Ideas Live show. We'll see you then. Thanks for being here. Aloha.